Shall you get us started, Santa? Good. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Weekend Walkabout in our gardens and years virtually. From GardenAtoZ.org, I'm Janet Makanovich. I'm Santa Claus, uh, <laughs> a.k.a. Stephen. And uh, we are talking today about Thanks Great Grand Folks, which is a, a history of gardening in the, the U.S. Midwest, the North American Midwest, because we want to place you practically in the remarkable chain of gardeners that leads to each one of us. Uh, that's me in my garden gear. And, and that's me normally. And Goofy, he'll look like that in a few hours when I get to cut this beard off. You who? Up. And, yeah. uh, and you, you know that we've written some things. Uh, and while we've been writing for the Michigan Gardener, for the Detroit News, writing our books, um, we end up with a lot of research bits and things that we find along the way that have interested us quite a bit. Um, we write them now, uh, do the writing on our website, and a, ver a, a cool page, which is a long page with a lot of stuff in it uh, that you might want to go to is our quotes page. Go to the gardenadoz.org and type in quotes into the search field, and it will take you to this section where you can find quotes, um, quotes like, in every garden, every man may be his own artist without apology or explanation, Louise B.B. Wilder, and, um, and a place where you can click on uh, topics that you might want to go to, uh, tools, birds, weeding, and find quotes on those. We've been gathering them for a while. From... And we're due to update it someday. Oh, too, we keep, we we keep, keep, keep finding new stuff. Yeah. And in looking at the history of gardens, um, it makes you look at your own personal history and who it is who contributed to you. In my case, um, very, very, very uh, uh, similar in looks to my dad. And I think about my dad all the time when I weed, he taught me to bounce the, the shovel in order to loosen the soil and be able to get the weeds out. Stephen, we haven't figured out who he follows in terms mm -hmm. of his uh, gardening heritage. I, I'm the some, outdoorsman. He's got so many of them. Uh, I thought I was in a big family, but he's got a big family that goes back generations. And, uh, you know, looking at this, Stephen, I do think you look more like, like the girls in your families and yeah. the Usatellos than, uh, than you do the boys, yeah. Eldon and Irene and Ellen and Jenny Alan and Alan stuff. there. Yeah. yeah. So this is all about appreciating your legacy, whatever that legacy might be, and growing it some and handing it along, which uh, takes us to the person that most of you know who is here, our daughter, Sonia Nicola comes in each week as our co-host in order to keep uh, the chat and technical questions figured out. She's a, Thank one, goodness. <laughs> she's a wonderful person to do that. Here she is with uh, Steve's mom, Dolly. Sonia is a professor at the University of Toronto, so she ha is very well versed this year in working with uh, Zoom and this kind of technology, but also she's a great gardener. Uh, she's She didn't need anybody to tell her how to do. I think she's been channeling some prior gardeners her whole Somebody, life. Yes. yes. And we are in the uh, process of handing things down to other people. We have been our whole lives and you have been too. Here's Amber, who was thrilled to find out that with a come along, she could move that rock herself if she placed the stuff right. If and, you do it right and safe, you can do things. And once boyfriend, foreman, hunter, saw her starting to do it, he said, here, let me do that. And she said, no, it's mine. I'm going to move this rock. And that's the kind of empowerment that we like to do for people. We're going to have three chapters today and three times when we'll break for questions and answers and some flash chats along the way. Uh, we're calling this chapter one, 200 years to root. 200 years to take root just to get going. And we are working off of this outline. We'll tell you as we go along where we are. We want you to start off first with... Um, Gardening is history. There are people who say that civilization kind of goes back to the discovery of the wheel, and that's not the case. Uh, in Italy. Well, it's controversial, let's put it that way. There are a number of people who say, it's and the, we're on that side. It's the plow. It's the plow, that once people could grow enough food in one place to stay in a group, then they started having towns and cities and doing things together. So it's we gardeners who brought people <clears throat> together. And um, you are together with a number of gardeners. We've given you a timeline there. Uh, this timeline could go further back. Uh, normally when we talk to people in the U.S. Midwest, 1840 is about as far back as we're going to go for a gardener. 
we do have people who are um, with us today who are from the East Coast and might be able to go back another hundred years behind that. Maybe You'll just more. have to put a dot, dot, dot at the end of your line because what we'd like you to do as we're going along today is think about who you hark to in what places along that timeline. As a, for instance, you take the timeline, which is, starts up there on the, or, or is now uh, arrowed in 2020 and takes you back to 1840. And you say, when, when were you heading a household of nearly grown people? Um, you know, was, is that now that you're, uh, your next generation, whether it's yours or someone else's, is nearly grown? Or um, like us, is it in the range between 1990 and 2000? Um, place yourself on the timeline. So Janet and Steve... Our parents are about 10 years apart, so they kind of bridge between the 40s and the 60s is where our parents are. And that would be our first handoff of information. The vegetable gardening knowledge that I got from my mom and the basic uh, plant care and pruning I got from dad. Both of us go back to grandparents who were in charge of their households in the 20s and 30s. Um, my grandfather had a, a uh, ex uh, a spread out family and so it was actually a little earlier than 20s and Steve was more toward the 30s yep. and we both have uh, great grandparents that would have been someplace there in the 80s that I vaguely know uh, but Steve knows very well and then from there Steve can go back further to great greats and that's about that's it for about our it families for because that's when the they uh, that's when they showed up so some of you can go back further and as we go along today and go through the different um, uh, epics in gardening history in the last uh, 300 years, kind of place yourself and ask, who do I know that was there? We're going to start yeah. with the 1700 to 1800 time timeline. So there we are back on our timeline and in the 17 to 1800. And at this point in the Midwest, Detroit was a settlement. It was a fort. Uh, it was a place where people um, wipe the sweat off their brow when they got there and said, for a minute I can sit before I keep going through there. And most of the people that were in the fort and near the fort were concerned primarily with survival, growing things to eat, finding people who were growing things to eat, hunting to eat, keeping themselves warm. Um, throughout the country, Surviving. throughout the country, there was a lot of lethargy in agriculture in, in that hundred in that hundred years. It was a time when people just did what they had done and they didn't change tools, they didn't change crops. What they had figured out to do, they kept trying to do. There were no chemical fertilizers. Nope. Uh, manure <clears throat> was what you had. Um, the wooden plow, reinforced with some iron, was what you had or you hoed. And that's how you grew a farm, wow. an entire farm. By 1793, there were some gardens in Detroit because there were, we had uh, started getting un, uh, secure enough to be able to do that. But still in 1794, if you traveled 150 miles from Philadelphia as the Bartram brothers did who were collecting plants and sending them back to Europe, there was no trace of Europeans, just the very wise people who'd been here before that we'll have to make and uh, talk about in a, in a different time. Different time, time. yep. Um, and what was pretty interesting is, is, you know, what we think of as wilderness, that's wilderness. That's as far, that's what people saw if they could get to a high enough place to see it. See it. it. And, was, and then you, you thought, oh, once I climb that mountain, I'll be, and then you see them go on. They go on and, and on, those aren't and on even and on. real mountains. You might think of this as wilderness, and that's, that's a road at that time. That was the road. Armies like, marched along something like that. Like that. I mean, the wilderness looked like this. It was dark, it was mysterious, it was tangled. Uh, it was uh, an amazing place. And if you hid there and they were marching along the road, they were in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't look like this if you got to a high enough place. This was, this was farmed land. Someone had spent the time clearing that land between those, those stands of trees. Um, and <laughs> we also, uh, we knew how to prune but did we, we didn't know how to prune. We pruned, but weren't sure how to prune. Well, they knew that pruning was something that you did, but they didn't do much of it. And, and they did things that they brought with them from their old cultures, especially from Europe, but also to a certain extent from the, from the Far East for those people who did end up on this coast. Um, they pollarded trees. They didn't know why they pollarded trees. They were keeping them small in Europe. Here, you didn't need to. Right. 
they would cut them back real hard and every year let them grow into witch's brooms there. Or which, the Whomping Willow from right, Harry which Potter. Which if you let keep growing, will grow back up, but never look right and always be weak at the points where they were once cut. And the crazy always thing weak. is, this is still being done in a whole lot of places Today. because somebody's great grandpa did that. Um, and somebody thought they needed to do that. Some but, arborists still do right. some of this. Yeah, but this was being done because in Europe, there wasn't room. In, there just people were stacked on top of each other. There wasn't room for a tree. There wasn't, you needed to have room for carriages to go underneath. So they plotted, but here we had plenty of room. Um, their, uh, the orchards were pretty easy things to grow because the pests did not catch up for a while. This is a ginkgo, a branch from a ginkgo. And ginkgo, we now think of as the um, pest-free tree. It's so old, it's lived past all it's of its pests. lived through everything, through except, them all. Except that we've only been growing the ginkgos here since I think Jefferson uh, imported the first few. I know one of them was at uh, Cave Mar Hill. And one was at Monticello, uh -huh. if I remember right. Too. But now this, uh, what you're looking at on this canker, discolored canker on the ginkgo branch, is something that we found that, as far as we can tell so far, is a disease that lilacs get and has now managed to find its way to ginkgos. Well, what happened with the early people in the 1700s and 1800s is that at first, their fruit trees, uh, many of which they brought with them, with them. Uh, were growing fine. And then the pests caught up. Then the pests began to, to follow them. And the pests had no pests. No controls. No, no nat native controls. Yeah. So people at, uh, in the middle of the 1700s and strongly at the end of the 1700s, people like Benjamin, Harris, Benjamin Franklin and William Harrison were saying, we have got to get this together and, and pass on some information because a plowman on his legs is, is higher than a gentleman on his knees. They were saying, the, this is what's going to make the country move, is having our plows work better and our farms work better. But that, in, but during that 17 and 1800s, not much changed. People just kept doing the same things, whether it was right, wrong, or indifferent, till we got to the early 1800s. And now there are agricultural societies, like the Massachusetts uh, Agricultural Society, Society and yep. Canada, which was ahead of the game in 1794, where they got together and said, let's share information and figure out how to do things. We don't even know how to grow stuff here. No. This, Climate is entirely different than where we came from in Europe. It's not a Pacific Northwest kind of moderated winter climate um, where when we set up the, uh, the uh, model for, doing, for taking air temperature, we set zero where we set zero because that was the coldest it ever got in most of Europe, zero. Yeah. Then they and found themselves here, here where it was gonna be 10 below, 20 below, um, even more than even that. Even colder. So they had to figure things out, and the agricultural societies really helped there. Um, it was big news that they could plant beans and peas, things, legumes, and find out that those improved the crop. That was big news, and they shared that kind of stuff around. The horticulture, the gardens were only, if wealthy, like, like the Jeffersons and the Washingtons and people that had the money in the, right. in the acreage. The crops, if you were a farmer, you didn't want to be more than two miles from water or railroad, because how do you get your crops anywhere? Right, you couldn't, the, uh, the farms, in <clears> most <throat> cities, the farms were ribbon farms. They were narrow, long farms, everybody looking for that little piece of river frontage. So they had a place to load their crops onto boats to take them somewhere. Otherwise, you couldn't do anything with all this stuff you were growing. Um, and when the Erie and Welland canals were finished, all of, the, yeah, all of a sudden, Detroit, the Detroit River was carrying twice the tonnage that London carried, twice the tonnage that New York Harbor was getting, because it just opened up a whole big uh, bread and, basket and, and furs and People were logs. Wanted and, to move. They wanted to go west, young man, go west. So um, the, the wealthy people had the flowers, the pretty stuff, the new stuff. And fortunately, a lot of them were quite... Um, the Brahmins, as they called them in, in Boston, they were uh, philanthropic and they handed things off to people. So they said, here's a good fruit tree variety that we figured out yeah. and uh, gave it to other people through the agricultural societies. Um, so um, Sonia has informed us that there are a number of people who come to our webinars who um, 
who imbibe in the morning <laughs> and they get to take a <laughs> drink coffee every time they see our our, our client's garden there on beacon yeah. hill uh, <laughs> and uh, this is a this is an 1800 house now at the time and we're taking the uh, some vines off of the, the walls there with that ladder that's up at the time this was not there this is the front door you are standing on the sidewalk this in a city to have a 30 by 70 area that then went past here and eld around the back of your house to the yard the yard being the place where you kept the dust bins and where people made deliveries from the back alley um, that was the height of uh, extravagance to have that space um, and so i am showing you this garden so that you can take your sip this morning um, because I could have shown you Mount Vernon or other places on uh, on Beacon Hill, but this is who had horticulture, not other people. They didn't have flowers. They didn't even have um, crops, a lot of them. No. Even up to the mid-1800s, the average person who was outside of the city spent their day plowing, doing husbandry that's taking care of the animals, doing piecework on clothing, on quilts, on making furniture. Um, they were escapees from the old world. They were escapees from the crowded parts of the old world. They didn't know. They had no knowledge of agriculture, most of them, let alone of ornamental horticulture. And they, they weren't even sure what they were coming to sometimes. Right, yeah. They, they might have learned things as a farmhand, like how to make peach brandy out of the peaches that had been otherwise spoiled. No perfect peaches back then, no perfect fruit. Um, so they didn't know a lot about things, and they were living in the city because that's where they could find a place to live and there was no place to to grow you got your um produce from a market garden so people moved outside of the cities and set themselves up in a market garden which is uh if you clear a small amount of land you can grow five or six or seven different kinds of crops more labor intensive yeah. than growing just one but you can grow several different types of crops and take them into market until you get enough land clear that you can do the more economical farming and uh, when people grew when the cities grew then people had more leisure time they could move more out into the outskirts and that's was the outskirts and that was the outskirts but this might be your picture and at Dawes Arboretum this is their picture of, of uh, living on the outskirts or in the wilds this isn't what they did no they did not build a cabin that's how we woods. thought they knocked everything down within they, range of the building. They cleared. They yeah. didn't want anything falling on their buildings. Right. They worked hard to make those. And they wanted a clear line <laughs> of sight, so they were taking they were trees down. Defending themselves also, And they didn't have, And they didn't have a lawn or mowed area. They had whatever grew there and that the, crop, the uh, animals would eat down for them. So you kept your animals close to your house, cropping things down. Your sheep were right out front. Your chickens were scratching around right, right by your door. Yep. And, and in the in the cities, that's as yeah. The, the house, the, the houses were right up to the street, which made sense. That's where all the traffic was. That's where you needed to get and get in from and out to. There might have been a small area here. You see fences, and this is in uh, Detroit's uh, Cork Town, which is not oh, the, these houses were being built 1830, 40, 50. Um, a little space and that little space was occupied by packed dirt and chickens or in the case of my parents uh, and grandparents rabbits yep. um, something that was a food crop um, basically and a place where you could hitch a horse but there there wasn't gardens in the front um, uh, until you got the uh, the more the more upscale neighborhoods started to form this was a uh, uh, brush park in the Detroit area where suddenly these Victorian houses where people had the money to build something like this. And then there wasn't a garden, they put a tree. And when they first started doing this, not a lawn, we'll work on that a little bit later, but some space and they set back a little bit more. In the cities, still townhouses right up at the street, like here in, uh, in the Boston area. And in the South End, which was big in the uh, 1850, when they uh, filled the area and could build in Back Bay and South End, the townhouses right at the street, these eventually became tenements as people mm -hmm. moved out a little further. And now the new immigrants <clears throat> coming in lived in something divided into apartments. But you can see there's no room to grow anything there. Not a great ornamental horticulture background here. You could put some pots out. This is a, an 1850s house. Yes, it's been updated, but it's yeah. still an 1850s house. It's still got the footprint right up at the street. Um, and uh, 
this is very similar to what happens in other places. So our friend Rennie grew up in uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil, and that's her grandmother's house. You're, you're standing on the, the walkway. Behind you is the wall that goes across the paved little courtyard entry area to the house. And what's growing there in her, gar in her grandmother's very famous garden is a bunch of pots with lemon verbena and some herbs. That's what people did and still do throughout the crowded parts of the world. When you get out. Yeah, you have the money to get out and buy and build yourself a little place in the country. You gardened. That's where you could garden. You could have your own food. They weren't necessarily ornamental gardens at that time. Right. They were production. They were production food. gardens like this one is. And uh, they might have been a half an acre until more got cleared. But that was where produce was coming from. And produce didn't have to be fresh. Uh, you were using manures as fertilizer. So you didn't serve your produce fresh. You didn't have that much clean water to clean things with. You poured boiling water over it to blanch it and sterilize it. You and sterilized. you ate most things as pot herbs. So, and, yeah. and a lot of stuff went into alcohol. <laughs> yes, a lot of things got made into ciders and, and brandies. Um, and the big houses continued in this, at this time to have, there's no plantings around there, trees. We don't see any foundation plantings. There are some trees. And, yeah. and, and you can see you the can't little. can't define it as a lawn. You either. can see the bird bath kind of thing in the middle there. Quite often in Victorian times, there'd be a circle someplace with something in it, cannas or a bird bath. Um, the cities were very, very dirty. The soot that accumulated from so many coal fires and wood fires <coughs> was making it, literally, that's what it looked like right. in St. Louis uh, in the bottom middle there on one day in 1870s. So uh, it was difficult to grow anything in that kind of smog. You couldn't see, let alone grow things. So plants were, trees were being imported, being uh, brought from Europe that were known to be resistant to this kind of soot. That survives. Yeah, things like Austrian pine, Scots pine, Norway maples, uh, mm. Norway tree spruces, of tree of heaven from Asia. They were brought on purpose because they could live in these conditions. Horse chestnut, uh, one of our native plants found that they could, it could make it even with its flowers. And Tree of Heaven there behind my, uh, this would be the uh, early, um, this would be the 1920s, but these trees were here because they'd been there when Chuch's, uh, uh, Chuch's mentor told her what to plant, that behind them is the Tree of Heaven, yep. Elanthus. And, and this is a sick, uh, plane tree, London plane, London tree, plane that... tree. And this continued for generations this is now a generation later in Stephen's family, his mom, his aunt, and his uncle. Um, they're still planting those same trees because those were the trees that people had found would work, even though um, it did begin to get cleaner in the cities. Mm -hmm. By the late 1800s, at this point, we've got um, uh, Bailey, one of the most incredible minds in horticulture, in his mom's garden, learning from the Potawatomi how to grow things. He's um, learning from the experts. We're going to come back to him later, but we're going to get great advances in the in the late 1800s. We've got on the West Coast, uh, um, uh, uh oh, Shasta Daisy Burbank, Luther Burbank, another genius working on mm. things. And at this point in the late 1800s, the native plants that were sent back to Europe 80 and 100 years before, after people collected things, are now coming back here. They're coming back with immigrants. From finishing schools. They, <laughs> they right. refined them, they, they them. cultivated them, they hybridized. So the immigrants are bringing back snowball hydrangea, for instance, um, and cranberry bush viburnum. But they, they don't know how to grow them locally because they've never been here before. It's different. Quite a mix of information, but we do have now now the USDA, so we now have a federal agricultural um, uh, center for learning is established. And in 1890, after a number of near terrible catastrophes, they get the Weather Service folded underneath them because the, somebody realizes, you know, you really need to know a lot about the weather to grow. And in the uh, at at 1900, Bailey, who's now left Michigan, darn it. Um, we well, lost at least him. he was here. Yeah, we lost him to Cornell University. He's writing his encyclopedia, his standard encyclopedia of horticulture, which we'll come back to later. But people are beginning to accumulate local data, stuff based on 
what a couple generations here have grown and what the native peoples have grown rather than just handing off what they thought worked back. So in. their timeline has now, they're getting it from, not from Europe, they're getting it from, from people Mogadish. that survived yeah. a generation and two generations. So our, our um, founded, grounded uh, gardening history really starts in the Midwest in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. On the East Coast, it could have started a little bit earlier than that, although the East Coast got very populated and a lot of people yeah. living in cities. So we're still in 1900 having the houses built right up against the, house, uh, against the street and the grand houses <coughs> being built without gardens, just with a flat area. This is a, uh, one of our grand neighborhoods in Detroit as people began to accumulate money, the Victorian and and uh, gothic homes being built. So thinking about what people looked at and that this is the time of our great brands, Steve's and mine, what we'd like to know if you'd like to participate in a flash chat is what reaction do you think your great grand levels would have had to the garden you keep today? Knowing what they had as a garden, pots next to the street, maybe a plot in a community garden somewhere, maybe they were a farmer, um, so if you've got some thoughts there about what they would think, whether they would be, um, proud of you, whether they would be, they would be stunned. stunned, totally stunned, whether they would Where's the food? think you're being wasteful because you're not growing food in the space you've got. Or you have food. What kind of food is that? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Send that stuff you've got for everybody. Where are your vegetables? Where are your vegetables? There's nothing to eat, right? Look at all the work for nothing going on. Not very useful. How large the garden was. They would think I'm crazy. <laughs> Why are you wasting all the space? Yes, exactly. Why are you wasting? Yeah. So many people so close to and having in their own minds an idea of how crowded it was in Europe looking at what we're doing with all this stuff. Absolutely delighted to see the varieties and designs. Wouldn't they though? Some of the yes. people, oh, oh, oh they, the people who cherished those few seeds they brought with them to look and see all the things. The true horticulturalist, the, uh, the, uh, a man like Jefferson would be stunned, I yeah. think. He would, he would be pleased that some of his ideas were still here. Yeah, and you're right. They would be glad to see that their plants are still here because they brought those things with them. So um, going back to, to um, history then, in the late 1800s is when uh, somebody realized that people needed green space. Frederick Law Olmsted and others um, started uh, pushing for <coughs> and designing parks. So Central Park gets made and set aside for all the people of New York City. And shortly thereafter, Buffalo, yay, yeah. Buffalo. It's a botanical garden with a, a conservatory and a big loop that people can drive in their carriages around and see beautiful countryside as if they live in a manor out in the country. Um, and shortly afterwards, uh, Boston, which doesn't believe in drawing maps with North straight up and down. It's kind of a weird map, but uh, gets Frederick Law Olmsted <laughs> to help them uh, do their emerald necklace uh, around the, what was the city proper at the time from the, uh, um, Franklin Park through Arnold Arboretum circling up along Jamaica Pond and through Olmsted Park and Riverside and into the uh, Commons area. And it's still green there today. So we can see Arnold Arb, Franklin Park, along the Charles and out to the Commons. You can see the uh, Commons right there. And shortly after, the, the fine people of Detroit said, let's get that Olmsted guy to do something for that island that we've got out there. We can make that into a park. And Olmsted did draw a design, which Detroit said was too much. Was, no, 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 that's way over the top. We can't do that. And so Olmsted uh, has distanced himself. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't show on Olmsted's records as one of his gardens. He planted some seeds of the design. Though. Right. You could definitely, you so drive you can, through you go through some of his and then go on Belle Isle, you could see his influence. Yeah, they did, they did use some of the ideas, but these things were happening then in the late 1800s. And then we get to 1900, we have people running all over the world. Asia has opened up, Japan has opened up. Well, it kind of opened up. Yeah. We have plant collectors like, uh, like Wilson and, and, uh, and Sargent and, and Sargent 
and they are they are literally disguising themselves as natives in order to sneak smuggle around plants. and smuggle plants in and out. But they're bringing all kinds of new plants to botanical gardens, and horticulture is beginning to be to be on the radar for people who have some leisure time. And we but, got our first serious uh, tree loss, right. the, the chestnut blight. So trees the size of your house, literally massive the size of your house, trees. massive trunks that you could put six people to, to, to hold hands and go around the bottom are all dying right and left and suddenly you need more things to plant. It was a time when people were interested in what can we do. Yep. Um, and so now we've got horticultural and gardening societies. Steve knows about that. Yeah, they're starting up the... And we had legislation that took the federal USDA, the information from the USDA, and said, let's extend this outward through our universities. Kit houses, are the houses <clears throat> are still looking uh, close to the road. This is a kit house from 1900 where you could buy your, you'd have the Wells Fargo wagon bring you your Sears. From Ikea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, from Ikea. Um, the USDA had bulletins like this one. This is a 1918 uh, bulletin. Um, Larkspur was, uh, uh, it was consider. in the grazing areas and, and it was terrible. It was killing cattle and got to control this kind of stuff, and bulletins on how to do that. And these people are just trying to get away from what they had. They, they were put into armies, fought right. battles for having that they didn't even know why. Right. Grandpa, Grandpa McConovich there says, you know what? I'm out of here. I'm leaving. No, he grandpa's on. Oh, the, this one? The blonde right here. Yeah. Oh, that's you. Great. Yeah, that's yeah. Grandpa. Uh, I think he went AWOL. I don't think he left nicely. I think he sneaked away, yeah. but we don't know about that. But that happened in place after place. They're pouring into a place where there's space and the chance to get free. And even though once they got here, as Chacha and Chacha there, um, and uh, maybe Walter, we're not sure who that guy is, um, they, they're living in a house that you can't really call a mansion or wonderful. And that in just a couple of decades is going to turn into a neighborhood that um, that gets raised for freeways and yep. gets turned to over to the next wave of immigrants. They're not living in grand places, but they are dressing themselves up and sending home grand pictures. And they're showing the that it's paved with gold. They're giving that impression. They're doing fine. You didn't want the people that you came here to find a new life. You didn't want the people you left behind to think you were struggling. Yeah, and maybe they thought this was as wonderful and as it was. It might have been. But it this is what they sent, fantastic. and it just brought more and more people. Um, now, at the time all these people are pouring in, we're, now we've got Bailey's um, Encyclopedia of Horticulture, which has things that, yeah, if you can read that, and I'm sure you can, the autumn leaves that blow into the border afford the very best winter mulch, and yet it is common practice scrupulously to collect and burn these leaves. You have people giving, still today. Yeah, we keep not burning them because we stopped that. But what's going on in 1900 is all these people pour in and establish shacks to live in along the edges of town and whatever. Is that the the people who've been here for a while? start thinking it's time to clean this place up. Literally getting together and saying, it is time to get tidier here in, you, in America. It was very messy out once you got outside of the city. And part of picking up leaves was that move to get, to get cleaner. And we're gonna focus this on 1910 when lawn. Right. Lawn begins, not? grass, the lawn, right. the, the sculpted, mold, fertilized, yeah. whatever lawn. Yeah, and lawns had been around in North America, but not in the cities, not in the outskirts, not in the common person's yard at all. They were like in no Europe. Lawn, they but, were in, in the rich manners. But there were a bunch of dedicated promoters called garden club ladies. No lie here. They formed garden clubs because they said, let's clean this place up. Let's offer beautification awards. Let us talk to our husbands and our sons and our uncles and, and, uh, and, our and nephews who are developing new stuff and make them make this look better. And at the same time, golf is booming. Yes, but we'll, we'll get to that. Oh, part sorry. Yeah. But. So these people who uh, wanted things to look tidier, they had a place in the city and they had a place in the country. And in going from the city to the country, they were passing a mess. And they didn't want a mess when they were on their way to their house in the country. Um, they wanted what George Washington had, what Thomas Jefferson had. They wanted those velvet swords all over the place. 
regardless of the fact that people didn't have sheep and goats and cows and to, 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 graze. Keep, to keep it all clipped down. Um, there, <laughs> there were mowers, but um, they didn't work very well. You might look here, it says for horse or hand power. A mower like this was hooked to a horse wearing booties so that it wouldn't tear up, tear the, up grass. the grass. And uh, little boys would whip the pony along to, to yep. pull the mowers. Um, so they weren't real practical, but they said people can do this. And so they talked to the people building houses and said, and this is a 1900s house, 1900. They said, set in this back. development, set them back. Sir, set them back. We want wide sweeps of grass in front. And so this, is, this one is in Massachusetts. It's one of the first developments that was done this way. And even in the cities, they started pushing the houses pushing back. A little bit, a little bit. And coming up with new mowers new mowers um 1869 there was a mower patented in the u.s but it didn't catch on it just wasn't practical for people despite the fact that you can show victorian ladies with high heels and and uh corsets pushing it <laughs> they push, they, yeah. yeah at the time there it was a very heavy piece still a very heavy yeah. piece of machinery uh the book that push. stevens just read called the lawn a history of an american obsession it was written by a, a person who was going to do her doctoral thesis on lawn ornaments of the late 1800s. And when she went researching, found that there were no lawn, lawn ornaments, ornaments because, because there was no lawn. lawn and got into why there got to be lawn. Um, lots of ways. And all of, behind all of this is the Garden Club of America. Which was started in 1913. The Philadelphia Garden Club invited 13 other clubs from 13 other cities to get together and they said this is what we want they wanted alley uh, yep, they, they wanted, wanted a lot. lot of stuff and grass lawn was and they never would have been able to do it it had been being tried we got these mowers we got people who thought that would be a nice thing to do until they came up with things like it builds morale and that golfers wanted wow. to have a golf club they wanted to have a place to hit the balls around like those Scots were doing. And they wanted to know how to grow the grass. So somebody else got involved. The turf the, industry was, was founded to find grass that would grow in this climate. And so they, darned if they didn't do it. And then you had the USGA, the garden clubs, the turf industry, and then even oh. our government got involved. All the, leaning on people. I love this ad that Steve found here. Man's best friends, car, dog, and lawnmower. And <laughs> big house. In the picture there. Yeah. And uh, by the time they uh, they get a little further into this, they're savvy enough to have Sam Sneed Steve pushing the Toro new had lawn. him. Yeah. You know, like my my front lawn is like the fairway I played yeah. at Western. Now these same people who are pushing the lawns, because there's there's Bees grazing animals keeping things cut there. People don't have those, but they like that look. Also loved the look of the alley Long of trees. Alley. Here comes our, our legacy of our street has to have all the same trees. And it was Planted the garden the club. Down. They wanted the same tree all the way down the street. And so did the landscape and architects. And so did the landscape architects. Yes. So by 1915, we're into these bedding plants. People are into uh, putting out little uh, squares and circles of color in the front yard. Um, but all of this is at a time when we can't, we women can't even talk about pollination. It's just not appropriate at all. Can't do that kind of thing. But the USDA did um, fund the extension service at this point and started through our universities, our land grant universities, handing out information. So people did start growing things. They, they had seeds. They could uh, order seeds. 1920 was when Perry Morse started, mm -hmm. seed company started in Detroit. There was already seed companies on the East Coast in New Jersey and New York and Philadelphia. And um, Wayside Gardens started in 1920 because people were buying things and Getting sharing things. around clipping cuttings and, and seeds. So horticulture is really in our area going back to about 1900. And to the information like what to do about that terrible Canada thistle, thistle, which is explained in the, in the brochure that it is not Canadian, that it's Eurasian. And, and it says there's two ways to get rid of it. Two ways. Starve them out by frequently destroying all the top, plowing or cutting. Or, or smother. smother. <laughs> Does that sound familiar to anybody who's been listening to us Anybody for a while? been with us for a while? Yep. Yeah. Including use heavy paper, which should be laid with overlapping edges. You sound like Janet, overlapping by half. 
Um, and it's right on the inside cover, says the same thing, persistent cutting, maybe smothered. So what questions have you got about the pre-horticulture part of our history? Because we've just gotten into how things go now. Well, we only have one so far. Um, Janet was curious about whether the chestnuts were dying from something that was brought in from overseas, or do you know what was the chestnut blight? Where did it yeah, come the from? chestnut blight was a, uh, was a fungus that, um, uh, that affected trees in Europe, um, but did not, they had some resistance to it. And in probably the wood that was coming over here, as well as maybe some of the seeds that people were bringing chestnuts because they knew chestnuts from home, they carried the blight and it wiped through our trees. There was zero resistance to chestnuts. It blight. was faster than the emerald ash borer. Billions of trees died in a matter of about uh, 20 years. So those that survived, there are still some living in Michigan, live, survived because they were isolates, because people had farmed, had cleared the land for so many miles between chestnut A and chestnut B that the, the uh, fungus couldn't spread. They're still sprouting from some of the stumps. The, they do. the roots are still alive. They'll grow to fruiting capability and then collapse. And then they get killed. Um, so we saw several waves of this happen. First the chestnut blight, then we lost the, uh, the, the black locusts that people were planting because they were good fast trees and you could make good uh, fence posts out of them. The black locust got killed by a borer in great numbers. And then the Lombardi poplars, the upright poplars that were narrow and were fit on the streets of the city, um, started dying back from a fungus disease. And then um, it, it waited until about 1950 to show up was the American elm uh, blight when the we started losing those elms. We called it Dutch elm disease. It was not Dutch. Um, yeah, but well, that's what we call it. So we'll um, keep going then. Yeah, yeah uh, just one more quick one just came in. Uh, Gretchen is curious about where did Osage Orange come from? Osage Orange came from the USDA promoting trees that could be grown as thick uh, animal proof barriers in the, in the western regions, in the territories that were being developed. There, there was no barbed wire. It was, there were not enough trees as you got out onto the Great Plains to be able to build rail fences there weren't enough stones in that deep, three foot deep topsoil um, to build walls like they did in, the, in New England. So uh, the Osage Orange, which comes from a place down in um, Arkansas in one small valley, which has thorns on it and grows very hard wood, was promoted as something that you could plant as a hedge along with mixed other shrubs to keep your animals in, in, uh, in check. So you'll see Osage Orange throughout um, parts of what were territory in the 1850s including Michigan, you'll see Osage oranges in a line of four or five. And if you look close, you can see that at some point they were pollarded because somebody was keeping them cut. Um, and that's where the Osage oranges came there, from. There's a line of Osage orange out in, out in the Highland Recreation Area field trial area. And it's a straight line and it goes right down a road. And I, it, it, it I suspect it was planted. Yep. Yeah. All right, well, well that's all for questions. We, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Okay, we'll move on past our beautiful native sycamores. Big this one trees. At, this one at Brent and Becky's Balls. bulbs. Yep. Their bulb mm -hmm. field down below. Okay, so we'll end chapter one there so we can post these videos in, uh, in uh, little bits for you. Thanks for listening and stay tuned.